And now, Lifestyles Unlimited presents the Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Welcome to the show. This is Andy Webb with Lifestyles Unlimited. And as always, we are working on your financial freedom. And man, I'll tell you, I've been a member at Lifestyles Unlimited for over a decade now. And in 10 years time, I've learned a ton. And we, we, we learn and we, we talk a lot about operational things for rental property owners, both in the single family space, single family rentals, as well as apartments. We do both of those at Lifestyles Unlimited. We buy, renovate, reposition, and make a ton of money on houses and apartments. But a lot of what we do comes down to successful operations. And I'm going to get into some operational stuff today. And I'll tell you up front, this is going to be largely focused on single family houses, on single family rentals. If you do not own a single family rental, pay attention. A lot of what we're going to talk about does apply to you if you are simply a homeowner. You have your homestead. The things we're going to touch upon will be of benefit to you as well. Ways to save money, for example. And if you are a multifamily investor, pay attention as well. We've, we've had a lot of apartment investors that are now switching gears and adding a couple of houses here and there to their portfolios. I just had a conversation this weekend with one that's looking not, not for his portfolio, but for a family member that needs some additional income. And that's what we talk about on this show is creating additional income. And you can do that very easily with just one or even two, three, four single family rental houses. Now, you get that income coming in, you got to protect it. And we're going to talk about how to do that today, specifically around tax protest. I teased this a little bit last week. Quite frankly, I went a little long, didn't get to my listener's question as I, as I wanted to. So I promised you I would come back to this topic today, and we're going to hit that out the gate uh, so I don't go long and miss it yet again. So we're going to talk about the tax protest uh, discussion I saw, incidentally, it, it, during, during the week. Someone was getting ready to sell and said, hey, should I bo even bother to do my protest now. And for the listener that, that sent the email in, I just bought a house at a steal out outside of the window. Can I protest? We'll get to that. And I want to give you a little bit about my recent ARB appraisal review board experience. Now this is in Tarrant County. Uh, it was a new one for me. It was a new one for me. It went very well. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then let's shift gears again, thinking operationally, let's talk about your neighbors. Good, bad, ugly. Ooh, what, what if you have a bad neighbor? What if you have a bad neighbor at your rental house? What can you do? And then finally, let's talk some, you know, something that may be coming soon to your neighborhood if you are a rental property owner. And I'm talking about the rental registration program. Is it a bad thing? And what do you do if you, if you, if you get wind of that coming your way? So starting with tax protest. And, and I want to go actually, before I get to the listener question, start with the discussion. I, I, this is on a uh, real estate forum uh, that I uh, pay attention to quite a bit. And uh, a member there had posted the question and said, hey, look, my uh, appraisal review board hearing is coming up. So they'd already submitted their protest on this rental house. And uh, we're going to be able to protest that, go to the, the review board very soon. But they said, you know, looking at the market, I'm actually thinking about selling. Should I protest my tax valuation if I'm thinking about selling? What do you think? Absolutely, you should. Absolutely, you should. And I'll tell you that if you read between the lines there, and this is a very common misconception out there, a lot of people are afraid that if I lower the, the quote, value on the tax rolls, that that will impact my sales price, that that is somehow a reflection of market value. Yes, the appraisal district calls that market value. There are actually two values they'll publish, but market and appraised value. But uh, it has zero bearing. It has no effect on your true market value or on your sales price. It is a very common misconception. So if you are just thinking about selling, go ahead and get it lowered. Go ahead and get it lowered. Because if you're thinking about selling, that also implies to me, well, it may go the other direction. I may hold another year. Well, you want to get those lowered. And guess what? If you do sell, it's ultimately better for you since what's going to happen at closing? The, the title company, you bought the house. You probably remember when you bought the house, what did they do? They took the, the, the taxes for the year and, and they split those. They prorated your period of ownership and you got that percentage split of the tax burden and the seller took on the other portion. Well, they're going to do that for you at closing as well. So go ahead and get them lowered so you have a lower share on your title work, on your, on your closing documents. It's going to save you money. 
And going back to the notion of market value, you know, I, I am a licensed realtor. You do not have to be one to be an investor. But uh, if, if you go out to the MLS or ask any of your realtor buddies when, 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 you're, when you're working on a listing, it's going to show in there the unexempt taxes, meaning the tax burden for that rent or for that property that's for sale if you didn't have any exemptions on it no homestead no over 65 if you get that lowered and they can reflect the new value there that's a benefit number one but number two nowhere in that listing nowhere in that listing does it show the tax appraised value so again I just want to dispel that very very common misconception I hear it all the time I'm gonna sell I don't wanna I don't wanna impact my sales price this has zero impact Go protest, get it done, do it every year. Okay, great, I'm gonna do it. Now, here's what the listener wrote in and asked about. I just bought my house. This is a different question. I just bought my house, this was mid-year, or, 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 or sometime after the, uh, the protest filing window closed, which if you recall would have been, what, mid-April, mid-May, depending on where you are, mid-May, I guess. And his question was, well, can I still protest? Can I still protest? I got a good deal, got a smoking deal on this thing. It's they've got me on the tax rolls. I think his number was one ninety, hundred and ninety thousand dollars. He bought it for one forty. It's a fifty K spread right there. Can I still protest? Yes, you can. If you have any questions for me, email me at askandy at L U inc.com. I actually get a lot of questions about this very topic, which is tax protest, protesting the, the tax appraised value. Um, and here we're talking specifically to Texas. If you're in some place like, oh, I don't know, Chattanooga, great place to invest. By the way, I had a, a great conversation with one of our Lifestyles Realty team out there in Chattanooga looking at some great, great investments. I, I predict I'm going to be owning something out that way very, very soon. Um, but we're looking at Texas specifically because Texas, as you know, has one of the highest tax burdens when it comes to the property tax side of things. Our, our state has no income tax. So, hey, school's getting back. I'm, I'm seeing all those Facebook posts from you. My, my, my kids meet the teacher first day of class. Well, that's how we fund our schools here is through these property taxes. So that's a big, big piece. But you can protest those and, and you should protest those, especially if you own rental property, because as you know, there is no cap on the amount they can take you up every year. So you want to fight back. And especially, and this is the listener question was, I just bought my house and it's outside of the protest window. Am I, am I stuck? What, what, what do I do? Can I, can I fight this? And you can, there, there's a specific provision in the state code. It's section 2525 which allows for a correction of the appraisal role. And paragraphs A, B, and C, they have to do with other stuff. The name is wrong, the address is wrong, whatever. But paragraph D, section 2525, paragraph D, is the part that interests us. I'm just gonna, I, I took, a, took a page of paper, went ahead and printed this out. Very, very, we're not gonna read the whole thing, but it does say at any time prior to the date the taxes become delinquent. What does that mean? Well, in Texas, the, the bills come out start of October, due then, but you have until the end of January 31st, January 31st of the following year to make payment. After that, February 1, they become delinquent. So guess what? That means you can protest that property for 20, in this case, 2022, all the way through January 31, 2023, but there has to be a certain condition. It says there has to be an error. What we're trying to do is correct an error. If the appraisal district made a substantial error in value. Now I learned something in preparing for this show. I've always focused on the rental property side of this. I'm gonna hit two pieces here. If you are a homeowner and you just bought and you got a great deal because you bought a pre-foreclosure or a HUD home or, or something else off market, let's say, if you are a homeowner, this is great. They only have to have made an error on the high side by one fourth of the correct appraised value. I'm gonna translate that for you here in just a minute. And for rental property owners, if, if it's not your homestead, that, that one fourth applies if it is your homestead. Any other house, second, second property, rental property, whatever, um, if the if, if the appraised value exceeds by more than one third the correct we'll define that the correct appraised value um, then you can protest this out of the normal cycle so for investors again that means if you're you're 33 percent higher than your purchase price in this guy's case uh, on the tax roll so he paid 190 excuse me he they have him valued at 190 he paid 140 thousand dollars if I take 140,000 times 133 percent right I'm just marketing up by 33 percent 
that gets me to $186,000. So he is at 190, he's overvalued by more than a third. So he has that right simply by virtue of his purchase price. Another example, and this goes back a long time. I've got a letter here in front of me when I filed with the Denton County, it was the Denton County Appraisal Review Board. I said, hey, on August 2012, I, I bought this house in this city for $102,000, $102. At the time, we were on the tax rolls for 154. I said, look, we are 50%, actually more than 50%, overvalued relative to the purchase price. Purchase price in this case is essentially the market price. That's what they were willing to sell it to me for and that's what I was willing to pay. I said I request that this be this value be adjusted to my purchase price. I just sent a letter. This is my letter. And I enclosed with that my HUD one, my, my closing documents that show my purchase price, as well as some pictures and, and some estimates from contractors to get the house fixed up. In more recent years, I haven't even included pictures. I've just sent in the HUD-1 or the, the, the closing document, and that's been sufficient. You, know, you may want to send in a little bit more ammo. If, if, if you want to protect yourself, be careful. But uh, ultimately, I got it lowered. Saved a lot of money just by that simple fact. And this is dated. This letter is dated September 26th of 2012. So we had bought the house in August well beyond the, the regular protest window. And because we were more than 33% overvalued on the appraisal district tax rolls, we could get it lowered. We could have that argument. Now be careful. Uh, if you've already taken action and, and, and filed a formal protest and gone to the appraisal review board, this option goes away. If you've hired a, a, a property tax protest company and they've tried to protest on your behalf, that goes away. If you've already gone down and done an informal discussion with the appraisal and, and signed, signed a waiver saying, hey, we, we accept this value, well, you can no longer do this, okay? And again, you can do this throughout the year and, and, and a whole month into the coming year. It's a really good thing to do. And in fact, on this house that we bought, when we'd closed in August, the, the, the title company, as I just mentioned a moment ago, they'd already taken our prorated share for the property taxes as well as the sellers. And they had paid those property taxes at that higher rate. Well, now we got it lowered and we got a refund. And, and that refund was more than our prorated share that we had paid in. So this is a good way to actually make some money on your purchase. Okay. Again, you can go to uh, the property code, uh, or excuse me, the tax code. It's section 2525D as in David. It's a great read right before bed if you need to get some sleep, but it'll tell you about the one fourth correct, you know, one fourth overvalued for homestead and one third, 33% for rental investors or, or non homestead properties. Good, good opportunity. So to the listener, I already emailed him. He, he already got my, my feedback on this. If you have questions as well, again, email me, ask Andy at l-u-i-n-c dot com but i was like yeah go for it you you this is a slam dunk this is not a question go do it now i'll tell you a little bit about my recent let's keep on the the, the tax protest theme here before we start talking about those neighbors and i'll tell you a little bit about my my recent experience with the appraisal review board in tarrant county now if you're listening outside of dallas fort worth outside of texas you may not know where tarrant county is uh, that's the county where fort worth sits and uh a lot of my investments are in Tarrant County. I deal with these guys all the time, Denton County, Dallas County, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I went down there. By the way, Dallas County, I haven't even had my hearings yet. They're really dragging out the process. So is this discussion relevant still? Yes, it is. Yes, it is, because you may be like me and still be waiting for that appointment. That appointment may be a month out. By the way, if you have a conflict, you have one chance to just reschedule with no questions asked. I do that all the time. Push it back a little farther. Let more people get in there and get their values lowered because I'm gonna I'm gonna file my protest. I'm gonna discuss my situation based on those other tax appraised values. We'll get to that here. So yeah, it's relevant. It's relevant. Dallas, you're killing me. You're dragging it out. But um back to Tarrant. For me it was a new experience. I went down there, I had filed, I checked the box. Yeah, I want to do the appraisal review board, which traditionally is a a three citizen panel. These are volunteers plus the uh, county appraiser. So you go into the room, it's you, the county appraiser, and the th then the board of three, uh, appra uh, uh, excuse me, uh, three volunteers. Well, this was new to me because it wasn't three, it was one. I, I, I was given the option, I got there. Ah, stay tuned, music's kicking on. I'm getting, a little, I'm getting a little amped up here. I'm thinking about Dallas County. I need to get, we gotta get this resolved and get moving on. So we'll, we'll finish this up on the backside.
got questions? Call Lifestyles Unlimited at 855-497-4335. The Real Estate Investor Radio Show continues next. There is a dream killer here somewhere today. You're going to run into somebody that's going to tell you this stuff doesn't work. Like Vinette said, it's a scam. This is probably a multi-level marketing program. Somebody is going to tell you it doesn't work because you're the wrong race, the wrong age, the wrong sex, the wrong sexual preference, the something or other. And this is all set up so rich people can be successful and all you poor people can't. And if you believe that, they've won. But if you don't, you win. Don't believe the dream killers. Start winning today with the Lifestyles Unlimited free workshop. Get the knowledge you need to replace your income in two to five years and then find out how to take action. Register for the free online workshop at lifestylesunlimitedworkshop.com. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Andy Webb, and we're going to wrap up the conversation now about uh, protesting your taxes. I want, want to relate to you just very quickly my experience in Tarrant County. And if you've ever gone down and stood before the appraisal review board, you know, traditionally, it's 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 a panel of three volunteers, three citizens that are there to do their duty. And when you present your evidence and the, the county appraiser that's on the other side there presents theirs, those three, they put their heads together and they talk and they, you know, they're weighing things. They you may, Maybe they bust out a calculator, but it's three of them. And, and, and they talk themselves up. When I went to Tarrant, I was presented with the opportunity, the option to go in to a one panel review board. That means it was the county appraiser on one side, me on the other, and just one gentleman. And you know, they were running an hour behind. I said, what's gonna get me in and out faster? She said, well, first available. I said, let's do first available. Turned out to be this one panel thing. I'm really happy for this because it was me and one older gentleman looking eye to eye, sitting across the table, talking and having a conversation. It was much easier. Not, not this older gentleman looking to his left, talking to the guy to his left, and looking to the right, talking to the guy to the right on the panel with him. It was he and I. I mean, the appraiser was there. She wouldn't look at me. She was cold. She didn't like me. That was my feeling. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe she loved me. Who knows? But she wouldn't look over at me. And it was all business. But this guy and I, we, we were having a conversation. And let me tell you about my approach this year. I don't care about sales comps. I have not cared about sales comps. They have not helped me in any capacity. What I'm looking at is, and I, I hinted this a moment ago, I'm looking to see how the county has valued other houses on the appraisal district tax rolls in my neighborhood and specifically and this is the important part for you i don't care how they're valuing owner occupant houses and in tarrant county i can go onto their website and i can download a list of those comps right these they consider these comps they're called equity comps those are the tax roll valuations that they have for my my neighbors essentially and I'm able to download those. And I just did a very quick look. How many of these are absentee owners like I am as a landlord? I don't live there. It's not my homestead. And how many are owner occupant? They were all owner occupant. Well, there's my argument. Who are they comparing me to? Is it other absentee owners? No, it's all owner occupant properties. And this is important. This is important. And this was my approach with Denton County as well. I got some massive scores there. Uh, in lowering my values. I'm going to give this a go with Dallas here at the end of the month as well. What is your story? What is your preconceived notion about landlords and rental property versus owner occupant? You know what it is. Essentially, it's that an owner occupant is going to take better care of their property than a renter will take care of their place of residence. Now, you and I, you should know, I know this is not entirely true, right? That's why we are able to follow the lifestyles model. You know, we source great distressed assets out there. That tells me, for one thing, I'm buying from owner occupants that aren't taking care of their properties. And on the other side of the coin, we're very selective in who we allow to rent our properties. Best product, best price. That's the lifestyles model that yields the best people, and they take very good care of our properties. But there's that notion. There's that notion. Owner occupants, they're going to take care of their properties, and those renters, they just don't do that, do they? So you can use these preconceived notions to your full advantage. So I come out blazing, number one. Not not hot under the collar, but, but I got my ammo ready to go. Appraiser, these are all owner-occupied houses. 
here are, here are a handful that I went and pre-selected that are all absentee owner. And I made this argument to the single panel gentleman sitting across from me. Yeah, this is not apples to apples. This is apples to oranges. He got it. He agreed. So to find those absentee owner comps, you just need to look on your tax rolls. Tarrant County, very easy. You go out to that neighborhood code. Dallas County, uh, similar thing. There's a, there's a code for the neighborhood. Just stay in that neighborhood. Stay close. Stay close in size. Stay close in age and find those houses that are absentee owner on the tax rolls just like yours that are valued more to your favor. They're probably not using those. Make sure they do. And again, I got massive, massive wins because of this approach. For me, it was just a quick dump of the, the appraisal district data into Excel, right? Scrub it a little bit, pivot table, all that fun stuff that I used to do as a finance guy when I was in corporate America. And I got my list. And I focus then on the, the, if you're in Tarrant County, they call it depreciation. If you're in Dallas County, desirability, is it, is it rated as good? Can I get it down to average? Can I get it down to fair? Well, I'm going to base my arguments based on what they've told me other absentee owners in my neighborhood look like and how they're valued. So same for Dallas County. Like I said, that is my approach going forward. Uh, we're going to table this discussion. I think we're good for the balance of the year. If you are still out there fighting that fight, this is a great approach condition absentee owner use that preconceived notions and i'll you know i'll see how it goes um i expect some big wins though and i think you can too with the right approach and again going back to lifestyles unlimited you know, i've been a member for 10 years i learned a lot about what i do as a guy that goes out and protests his property tax valuations on his own i'm doing it myself i, I learned that through seminars at lifestyles unlimited a lot of the other operational successes I have are through things I've learned within that organization, either through formal seminars, or a lot of times it's just going out to, to case studies and meeting other members and, and asking them, hey, you're, oh, yeah, you know, I seem to recall you told me you're in Denton County too. In fact, you're in the city where I invest. What's, what's your experience been? You know, what are you doing for this situation? I've learned a ton that way. Networking is hugely important, and Lifestyles Unlimited gives you the environment to go out and do that. So if you haven't protested, well, you may have missed that window. If you just bought a house, do that evaluation. Am I am I 33% overvalued on the tax rolls? Go hit them hard if you if you are. Otherwise, let's talk. To, we'll have this conversation again next year. Keep doing it. Do it every year. Now let's shift gears. That's taxes. That's protesting those taxes in Texas. Don't know how that looks in Chattanooga or in or in other states out there, but um, there's probably some opportunity for you as well. Now let's talk about your neighbors. And you probably heard me talk on the show. I've studied Russian. I've studied Spanish. I've studied blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I, I made a stab at Arabic once. And as I was preparing the show, I, I remembered a proverb. El jar kabla al dar. Yeah, well, yeah, that's Arabic. El jar kabla al dar. It says, choose your neighbor before your house. And that makes sense. Make sure if you're buying a house to live in, that you're going to like who you're living by, that you're going to get along, that it's going to be a, a nice Pacific sort of life. You know, hey, this is great. You're not always in battle. But if I'm thinking about rental property owners, you know, first of all, how many of us actually do that when we buy our own personal house, go out and meet the neighbors first? Not, not, not a reality, right? Great proverb, not a reality. So if we're not doing that on our personal houses, you know you're not doing it on your rental property investments. You may not have even gone out to see the house, right? So we certainly don't do that. So what do you do as a rental property owner if you get a, quote, bad neighbor? at your rentals. Guy next door, person on the other side, person behind you, across the street. What do you do? And how do you prevent being a bad neighbor as well? Yeah, you don't live in the house. You're not technically the neighbor, but I'm going to be putting people into that property. Best product, best price yields the best people. And I will tell you my expectation for my residents is that they are good neighbors. And I tell them this at move in. And what do I do to help me along and make sure that we do have good neighbors when we put people into these houses? Well, just simply get out and meet those neighbors. If you're on site, maybe have your contractor, your, your handyman do that on your behalf. Send a letter. Uh, personally, I go to the properties. I have cards ready to go. I let them know what we're doing. Here's my card. If you ever have any issues, give me a call. I'll tell you for one thing, people love... Boy, those neighbors, they love to see you turn in around those ugly properties. I have gotten letters thanking me for changing the, the color of the exterior paint from salmon or pink or whatever it was to a more, a more neutral color, right? Thanks for getting rid of that gaudy, gaudy paint. 
They love seeing you turn around those properties. I love doing tours with the neighbors. Hey, look at this. Were you in here before? Yeah, I remember that. Whoo, it was pretty smelly, dog smell, etc. They love it. But more importantly, maybe a year down the line, I have actually gotten calls from those very neighbors when something's going on. Now, I'm going to tell you, best product, best price yields the best people. If you have questions, email me at askandy at l-u-i-n-c dot com. Let's finish talking about those neighbors. Great Arabic proverb says, choose your neighbor before your house. In an ideal world, we do that before we buy our homestead where we live. But I can tell you, as a, as a rental owner, I've never done that. Don't care. I'm, I'm looking at the numbers. That's, that's the important thing. But occasionally, we get those ah, questionable neighbors, perhaps, that we maybe need to do something about. Well, what do you do? Now, I told you in the prior segment, if you missed the prior segment or any part of the show, you can go to lifestylesunlimited.com, click on the radio tab. The shows are archived there. Um, but I told you, it's, it's a good idea to get those neighbors. You know, I mentioned that the, they love seeing what you're doing. They, they're really appreciate, appreciative of what you're doing to the property. I always like to let them know that, hey, we have very thorough tenant screening. I'm not going to put some yahoos in here. But if I do, by mistake, somehow, never happened. But if I do, here's my card. Give me a call. Never gotten a call for that reason. I mentioned a couple of situations where hail, there had been hail damage. Neighbor let me know. Hey, we had a big storm. Had some water coming up out of the ground. Neighbor said, hey, you might want to want to have a look at this. My my resident was at work, hadn't noticed it. You know, got a plumber out there. Wasn't a, was not our problem. Right. But it's that sort of thing that 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 I appreciate that that further community that's very helpful to me as as an active and, and, and as an active uh, rental property owner. And I will tell you one other thing, by the way, good thing to get to know those neighbors. I've made a lot of offers on houses immediately around those that I'm fixing up. People are in interesting situations that are your neighbors. And they may, they love what you're doing. They want to see you do that to their house, too. So a lot of opportunity there as well. But if it's a neighbor that's next to your rental property that is a problem, what do you do? Well, look, I don't have a magic bullet for you. I've got a couple of tips and tricks, things I've employed over the years, things that I employed actually just a few weeks ago. I had this come up. I was doing a tenant turn. My, my tenants had bought a house. They moved out. Next day, people moved in. I mean, very, very quick turn. But I was out at the property, and I saw some issues. Now, look. We're adults. Go talk to that neighbor. Be respectful. That's where you start, right? Have a conversation. If you read any, you know, so if, if you're an apartment investor, you you read the private placement memoranda, you see all the arbitration things and this and that. It starts by having a conversation. Now, in this case, the house next to mine was also a rental property. This guy clearly does not follow best product, best price, best people. They were not taking care of the property. Rang the doorbell, knocked. No reply, ring doorbell. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll be, give us an hour, nothing. I got nothing. So had to go a different route. Now, in this case, what did we have going on? Trees over the property line. By the way, if those trees are over your property line, yeah, you can trim them. And by the way, if you think that the condition is something that can threaten your property, well, document it. Send a certified letter to that owner, to that landlord, whether it's homestead or, or, or absentee owner, send a certified letter that says, hey, this is a problem and I'm afraid this thing can happen. Trees are a very common example. Dead or dying trees. As soon as you've documented it and if something happens, they are now liable. So document that. And back to my, my, my turn, tenant turn a couple weeks ago. This is a house that's a zero lot line. And if you're not familiar with that, that means... The, the property line of my neighbor, his yard goes right up to my house. Now, I have an easement. I'm allowed to get back there if I need to treat or have my exterminator do pest control or maybe, you know, when we're doing foundation work, the foundation company can go in your backyard to do, you know, all these things, the painters, etc. But like I mentioned, the tenant did not answer the door. The tenants have junk heaped up against my house wall. Well, that's a potential problem. I don't want road and harborage. I don't want other issues. I want it taken care of. If they're not answering, well, I need to find the owner. What did I do? Well, we talked about the tax appraisal district website earlier in, in, in the course of the dialogue on protesting your taxes. I go to that very website. I put in the address, and I get the owner's personal address or business address, whatever it may be. I sent a letter. as it. said, hey, got these problems. Your, your tenants, blah, blah, blah. You know, you, you describe it as you need to. If it's something that is an impending danger, again, certified mail, so you document that that got there. But this guy, he called me back. He called me and uh, introduced him, let him know who I was. He, you know, we had a great conversation. He, he, he confessed to me, he said, well, yeah, I, I, I don't get out there as often as I should. This guy is not a Lifestyles Unlimited member, I can tell you. 
the house, I, I let him know. I said, hey, I was up on my roof looking around, checking for nail pops, that sort of thing. I, I self-manage. I'm very hands-on. You don't have to be, but that's how I operate. And I'm up there, and I said, you know, you've got a hole in your roof. The guy had a hole in his roof. He had no idea. Shingles were gone, hole in the decking. I let him know, you know, just as a as a nice guy thing to do. Your fence has fallen down, your, your window, all these things going on. And here's my problem. Trees, junk on my house. He's going to get it taken care of. You know, oh, and by the way, I said, you know, it looks like you're kind of struggling. I haven't been out there in a while. I offered to buy his house. He's not ready to sell. <laughs> so, but it's another opportunity. Always be buying. Always look for that opportunity. He knows. He's got my number now. He's got other properties I asked him, so we'll, we'll have another conversation, I'm pretty sure. He's going to get it taken care of if he doesn't. Or if that homestead owner-occupant person is not taking care of business, what do you do? Well, you can escalate. You, you certainly can. I don't think I'll have to go to that point. If nothing else, I'll reach out to code enforcement, say, hey, you know, this, this, this problem. You, you, you're probably familiar with code in your city. It's going to be similar in this city. Um, just let them know, and they'll apply the pressure for me. I don't have to do anything else. Not the ideal way, but we'll, we'll approach it as adults to begin with, and that's the best thing you can do as well. And it helps to know those other neighbors in the, in the community too. So that's neighbors. Last thing I want to get to is this came up actually very recently as well from a listener uh, asking about uh, rental registration programs. Is this a common thing? And a lot of cities, I'm just looking at DFW, Dallas-Fort Worth right now where I invest. I'm across the Metroplex. I'm in a, a ton of municipalities. And I'll tell you, some of them do have rental registration programs. And some of them have rental inspection programs. And some of them have both. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Well, I think it depends on who you ask. Now, the city we were just talking about, they don't have either. They, they're not putting eyes on rental properties. If they were, my house is fine. I'm not sweating it. My neighbor next to me, with the issues that I talked about, he would be having to deal with some work. And I'll tell you, when you are investing and moving into a new city as a residential rental property owner, first thing you want to do is find out if they do have any sort of rental program, rental registration or inspection or both. When, when it's just rental, I'm in a few cities where I just have to pay them every year. Yeah, it's just overhead to register my house. And that's where it stops. Then I have other cities where they come out and they do an inspection and, and other cities that have just implemented these programs. And this is where the conversation with the listener came up. They are going to come out and they're going to start inspecting his property. What should I do? What do you need to do? And if you're moving into a, a new to you city or municipality, well, reach out and t typically to the, the building department or permitting department or code enforcement department. These are the guys that are, that are typically running these programs and just find out, hey, what is it you're looking for? Do you have a checklist? First thing I do, if I'm going to Cedar Hill down near DeSoto, I don't have any houses there, I'm going I'm to start with the city. Who do I talk to? Is there a rental registration program? Is there an inspection? Do you have a checklist? and make sure I address whatever things they're looking for up front. Now, I'll tell you, one of the cities where I do invest that is south of Dallas, where I have a number of rental houses, they finally, after years of talking about it, they did now implement a new program. Now, I had the opportunity as an owner down there to get in on the meeting, on the board meeting. I gave my feedback. Seems to have had some impact. I told them about another city where I invest that does this very thing as well. They only charge me $10 a year. Well, now my charge here in this new city, $10 a year message for you is get out and get involved and you can have some some impact on these sort of programs as well back to the question though is it a good thing or a bad thing well if you're a slumlord it's a bad thing but if you follow the lifestyles model best product best price ultimately it is a good thing in my prior example that that city like i said does not have this sort of program in place but if they did that discussion that i had to have with that landlord that that would have been a non-issue I wouldn't have had to have that discussion. Now, in my case, where the city implemented the program, here's another example. Turns out when they did the inspection, I got flagged. I got flagged. I got a letter. It said, hey, your trees in the back are overhanging the alley. That's something that my, is in my lease for my tenants to take care of. They weren't keeping up with it. Now I know. Essentially, I have an extra set of eyes on my property. We got it cleaned up. Move it on. For the record, I do prefer less government to more. 
I don't want people meddling in my affairs if I can avoid it, but if they're going to put these programs in place, you know, try to use them to your advantage. So we've talked about a lot today, and if you missed any of the show, again, go to lifestylesunlimited.com, click on the radio tab. My name is Andy Webb. You can find the shows there. Um, we talked about protesting those property taxes. You can do that out of cycle if you're buying right. If you're a member at Lifestyles Unlimited and you're following the model, you know you're buying right. You're getting your properties at a discount, and if they're heavily discounted, yeah, you can do that. Go ahead and protest those out of cycle using Section 2525D, D as in David. We talked about neighbors. What do you do if you, you get that bad neighbor? Well, we talked about that as well earlier segment. Go give that a listen. And finally, rental registration. It's a thing. It's growing. I'm seeing it coming in, in into more and more cities. And if, if you want to learn more about how cities operate with respect to those programs, talk to your other investors. Again, great place to go is Lifestyles Unlimited Case Studies. We have so many members that are single family and apartment investors. They're gonna, you're going to find somebody that has experience in one of those cities where you want to operate or where you do operate. Whether that's Mesquite, east of Dallas, they're tough. Garland, they've got an interesting program. Hearst, they've got a rental program. Louisville, yeah, they, you know, they're kind of start and go, touch and go, not doing a lot lately. But you can find out and learn by talking to others. And it starts by going to Lifestyles Unlimited. Go to our website, you can catch the show there. And while you're there, join the free workshop to learn more. There's a button, very easy to do, an hour and a half of your time. So hey, thank you for listening. I hope you have a good day. The information and opinions you hear on the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show are those of the hosts, guests, and callers. The Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented constitutes